Okay, so welcome back to day four of working on our still life painting. Um, today, as I wrote on the feed here, I'm gonna sip my coffee. Um, today, uh, we're going to jump in. We're gonna ex examine what I call uh, small relationships in painting. And uh, if it sounds like I have established terms for all these things, I don't. Um, I have a way of working. And then when I come to uh, create these posts, I'm like, how could I work that? And so uh, small relationships is something I came up with today. But uh, it is what I do at this stage of painting where I'm looking at, I have the big picture masked in. Now I wanna see how side by side, little moments, how they compare with each other and what can be brought up and heightened, what can be knocked down and diminished. And by that, I mean, if something has too high a level of contrast, um, it's going to advance towards the viewer. Um, but if I want it to actually have a lower level of contrast, I want to decrease the uh, con uh, lower level of attention. I want to decrease the contrast. Um, that's a generalization. You can definitely, definitely, um, you can establish that as being a formula, then dispense with it as you, as you see fit. But there are some areas in the canvas that I know that I want to send further away from the viewer and other areas that I want to advance towards the viewer. Um, so with that, um, I also want to talk about softs and sharps. So the softs and sharps of the painting are, um, it's, it's our way of guiding a viewer's eye around the piece. And there's this uh, amazing painting by John Singer Sargent. And uh, I forget the name of the portrait sitter, but it's uh, available, you can find it online as portrait of a young man with a jade walking stick, jade, J-A-D-E. Um, and I saw that painting at the National Portrait Gallery in London. And uh, you look at that painting, it was there, probably saw this painting maybe six or seven years ago. And you look at the painting and there are areas of that canvas that are so soft. And every transition is just almost like one nebulous mass breathing and giving way to another. But then there are these liquid electric, like kind of like strikes. They look like almost like these vivid, sharp slices. So if you zoom into that John Singer Sargent painting, Portrait of the Man with the Jade Walking Stick, um, then you'll see the floorboards have light hitting the side of them. So the floorboards have this like very, as I remember it, they were like bluish light um, hitting the floorboards. And so everything is smoky and masked in, and then you have this liquid strike. And what that does is it guides your eye around the painting. So uh, painters such as John Singer Sargent, uh, Zorn, um, they would guide your eye around the canvas through the language of softs and sharps. I'm not saying they did that exclusively, uh, but I'm saying that they did employ that. And so these selective sharps would catch your eye and send it around to the next point. Um, my teacher uh, was fond of saying, Charles Cecil uh, was fond or is fond of saying what his uh, teacher taught him, Gamel. And it's a saying that goes, the eye can only withstand a certain number of sharps. So if you look at your work and everything is sharp on your canvas, the consequence of that is that nothing really grabs your attention. Um, I think of the, the saying, um, if everybody is special, then nobody is special. It's, it's kind of that, that whole idea of if everything is a climax, there is no climax. You need the plateau and then you need the peak. But you need the peak, you need the plateau in order to have the peak. If it's just a series of peaks, there's no special attention there. And it's the same exact thing for me with sharps. Selective sharps placed in choice areas that lead your eye around the canvas. And um, not saying that the 19th century painters were the zenith of all painting, but the 19th century painters, in my opinion, seemed to do this um, just about, I don't want to say better, but they did it in such a way that it was brought to a level of perfection. So with that, um, I'll also say that between yesterday's painting session and today, I painted for about another hour. And if you want to see what I worked on, I provide a little time lapse. Um, it's about a 30 second time lapse video that you can watch. It just shows you what I was working on during that interim period. So with that, I'll jump right over to the palette.
mixing colors with my coffee and I'll place that right over here. Um, the first thing you really want to think of as you as you begin working is you begin, begin mixing colors you want to step back from your canvas so as I'm standing at my palette I can see my canvas and I want to ask myself what is working well and what is failing. Um, so I can tell you right now that this egg right here and the composition, um, this egg right here is really, really bright. And it just has this, is vivid, it's bright, and it pops out. Um, my egg is not so bright. And so I have this dance that's in front of me and I have to figure out what I wanna do. I want to get my egg to sing as loud as that egg right there. However, I don't want to, you might think to yourself, well, if you want it to really be pronounced, then the thing that you probably want to do is you want to um, go in with more like, let's say lead white paint and just like blast the paint on there and just raise the value of it. But when I bring in the white paint, it's gonna kill the chroma. So um, you don't want to introduce too much white paint into a highly chromatic area. An area that just, it doesn't even have to be highly chromatic. I just wanna say rich in color. Um, you don't wanna to put too much white paint in there because if you do, the color is just gonna completely gray out. So there's this dance that I have right now and artists will spend their entire lives uh, exploring this dance. Uh, Bouguereau, as a painter, um, as a technician, I, I really admire him. Um, as a painter, he would get this brilliant light on his models and he, I don't wanna say he sacrificed color, but he didn't quite go for rich choice color on the light side. Let's say the face were getting hit by light over here. Um, he had these very pale skinned figures. Uh, the result was immensely successful. Um, his work is absolutely beautiful. But then you take another artist, uh, let's say Ray Pen, R-E-P-I-N, the Russian painter, but he wouldn't sacrifice those rich, almost I want to say like bronze flesh tones, um, he wouldn't sacrifice the flesh tones for the light falling on his subject. So the game changes. So what I'm talking about here right now is chroma versus value. So standing back, I don't know how much lighter I can push that to make it brighter. Um, to tell you the truth, I'm looking at it and I'm somewhat stumped. So here's what I'm going to say. I am going to work on everything that is around that object and see if I can get everything around that object to really sing. And then if I get everything around the egg to sing, then maybe that egg will advance more. Okay, so I'm just going to grab some the table color on the top there. I see a little bit of Venetian red. I actually wish I had a little bit of sienna, uh, burnt sienna, but I, I waste it out of my tube. But I'll make do with uh, some umber and then also some ochre. So I have some Naples yellow in here, some umber, some Roman ochre. If you guys have questions as I'm painting, please feel free to um, write in your questions. I'm happy to answer to the best of my ability. All right, so with that, I think I want a little bit too ochre. I'm gonna try to double back. Okay, so I have about four colors in there. Venetian red, burnt umber, Roman ochre, Naples yellow, deep, and a little bit of white, a uh, touch of black, I think will quiet it down. And I'm just going to dig in from the other side and see what that does for me. So just with that, the egg is already advancing. Um, I have another idea. If you look at this image right here, uh, if you look at this moment right here, this is what I call those, those small relationships. So the back of the egg is being carved out by the light on here. 
I don't want to make the back of my egg too much darker because if I do, it's just going to become like kind of a heavy mess. And um, not saying I'm fluent in Spanish, um, but the thing that I like to talk about, uh, a term that I like to talk about, I can only uh, convey it in Spanish. I lived in Chile for um, about half a year and they had a word that they would use when they would talk about something that was distasteful um, in a sense that it was too weighty and they would say pesado. Um, so it's a perfect word and I don't know its exact parallel in English. Maybe we would say weighty, but pesado means like undesirably heavy. I don't want this to become pesado over here. I don't want it to become so heavy and to lose its color that it just doesn't turn well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the shape of the bag. And when you, the, the more you study paintings, such as let's say the old masters, such as, um, let's talk about for a moment, Velasquez. Uh, Velasquez has paintings where he absolutely does not have a logical conclusion to certain passages. And he doesn't need to. He knows that he doesn't need to. So if you look at Velazquez's painting, The Surrender at Breda, there is a moment in which the men standing behind the horse, there are more body, there are more legs. So there's a horse with a bunch of men standing behind it. And the men standing behind the horse um, there are more bodies, or fewer bodies, than there are legs visible beneath it. So you could say, well, what the heck are you saying? I'm saying logically it doesn't work. Um, it's a disconnect in the two-dimensional world where there are more legs than there are bodies. Um, so painting doesn't always have to be logical. I'm gonna try to tell a lie over here and see if I can carve out the back of this egg, even if I just have to use the side wall of the side of the bag right there. And when I look at that shadow, I just see a tiny bit, maybe more so of a cobalt blue. I don't have any cobalt blue squeezed out at the moment. We're gonna experiment with this king's blue and see if I can carve that out just a little bit. Uh, nope, it's too light. So I'm gonna double back and I'm gonna grab my cobalt blue. And Williamsburg cobalt blue right here. And I'm just going to inject that into the shadow. And now come back here. Still a little bit too light. So I'm going to come back with my ivory black. Something I learned early on in painting is to use your incorrect mark to get your correct mark. And I will put down paint and take a look at from a distance and I'll say, wow, that was a spectacularly bad idea. But I'm going to use that bad idea to inform what my better than bad idea might be. And sometimes by that slow process, I'm able to like creep up on the perfect color, the perfect shape, the perfect form, the perfect light, whatever that might be. So I've shimmied the side of the bag down. I'm kind of implying now that the bag is coming more at this angle. Before it was coming more this way, left to right. Now it's coming a little bit more diagonally. Uh, and I'm going to step back and make sure that that doesn't do any damage to the composition. Uh, not in the slightest. It seems perfect. So now the back of the egg is really reading. Um, it's the back of the egg is working extremely well as far as my eye is concerned. I'm even going to make the back. I'm allowing the bag to kind of expand out at the base. If you think of a sack of flour, as you go into the the base of a sack of flour, the weight is going to push it out, right? Um, so. Gravity is something we really have to think about in painting. Uh, they make dams much, much, much thicker at the base because when water sits in a lake, in a reservoir, the pressure at the bottom is much greater. 
So it's always, in painting, I always exaggerate gravity and I always make items that are like a sack of flour thicker at the base, although right here, it's not that much thicker. Um, but I'm gonna do it to exaggerate that sense. So maybe I went a little bit too, maybe I went a little bit too blue. Um, really doesn't matter. I'm actually seeing it, see it as being a little bit more gray. And I'm just gonna go right in and place that in. But again, I'm very satisfied with the way it turns. Okay, so now this side of the egg, um, I want that to pop off. And so we talked about this the other day. Um, how do you make something lighter? Uh, sometimes the way that you make something lighter is you make everything around it darker. Um, don't use that as a formula for oil painting, but I'm just giving you one approach to making something lighter. I want that egg to become lighter, but I don't want to lose my chroma, so I'm going to darken everything around it and see what happens here. And not using too many colors here. I think I see a little bit more green on this side. And just loosening up the paint a little bit. Going in. And I want to strengthen this shadow over here. These, these two can't compete for the same footprint on the canvas, but um, it definitely can go darker. So I'm gonna go darker and then work my way towards the light. So I'm gonna start really dark right here, keeping in mind that I can't go too dark. It's a white bag in the cast shadow of that milk. So I can't go too dark, but that's okay. And then I'm gonna to go to the extreme other side of that. Um, I'm gonna lay this brush down because there's so much black paint in there. And now I'm going back to the light portion. And let me see, maybe the way to find this after I'm changing my mind is to go light against that. Maybe that's the best way for me to find the outside of the egg there. So I'm looking and it works. It's successful. So I'm gonna bring this shadow. Again, I didn't have any of this planned before I started painting today. There's a deep dark shadow on the bottom of the bag. And I'm gonna go ahead in and I'm gonna put that so I have the best of both worlds. I have a nice dark right here. And then that light is very successful in popping the form of the egg. So constantly as I paint, I'm running into little passages that are problems and I just have to work my way out of it. But you can almost have like this like a steady optimism as you paint that if you're enjoying, if you're delighting in what you're looking at, you can find a solution. So perfect, that works really, really well for my eye. Um, the tabletop right here is a little bit darker. Um, I have it pretty light right there. So I'm gonna go in with my Venetian red and my ivory black. Uh, some people have been asking um, in messages like, like, do I use other reds? Definitely. Um, I have about probably eight or nine reds um, that I use, but when I looked at this piece, I really saw um, the most pronounced color that I saw was Venetian red. I mean, I saw it everywhere, and so that's what I'm going with. I do wish I had my tube of burnt sienna. I don't have it with me right now. Um, I used it up. see if I can get that taper. I don't want it to be too 
cavernous back here. I don't want it to be so dark that it, it doesn't really make sense. But I'm just gonna put that in as a placeholder to see how that how that goes. Um, it is a little bit too dark, but I'm, I'm really not too worried about it. Over here in the corner, I always have some paper towel that I can dry my brush off on. So I always do that. I got that trick from my buddy James Hayes, a painter over in London. He always has some, he always has some spare newspaper, his newspaper to the side of his palette, and he dries his brush off the newspaper. I think it's a great trick. And coming back in, so I'm just trying to relieve this passage a little bit, that it doesn't become too murky. I don't want any, I don't want any black holes over here. Okay, so I feel really, really happy with that conclusion. Um, I really like what's going on there. So now, as I step back, I think that this passage right here, um, the blue that I got in there feels false. Um, it feels correct over here in the shadow, but when I look over here, I don't really see that. Uh, it just feels, I don't even know how to say, it just feels uh, like a little bit of lazy painting there. Because I, when I look, I don't see anything like that. So I'm gonna double back. I see this being a little bit more of a cream. So I'm grabbing my brush, Kind of dipping it to a little bit of Naples yellow, um, a tiny bit of Roman ochre, and there's a cream right here that's definitely towards the side of a green. And I'm going to double back. So just to return to what happened here, this is ivory black with a touch of uh, cobalt blue. This is this is white over here, but when you combine white with ivory black, especially when it has a little bit of blue in it. The result is you get this kind of like this nice cool, um, just a cool white, that's what I'll call it. Um, but it doesn't make sense. Like it's okay if it's bluish over here because I see it as being very blue on this side. But over here, we've already established that really the predominating like color of the bag is cream. So that doesn't make any sense. So it's important as painters that we pay attention to when we have um, like blended something in a lazy way. So that would be lazy painting if I left that there. And it really just wouldn't jive with the viewer's eye. So I'm stepping back and examining how that looks. That feels a million times better. I can still go very light over there. It just has to be more in the family of the cream. And I can't blend this too much because I don't want that resulting bluish effect. I'm probably gonna go a little bit more ochre and black. Um, ochre and black creates this really, ochre obviously is not green, but ochre is green-ish. Um, I don't really believe I don't really like classifying things such as Naples Yellow, Roman Ochre, into just one family or another. I like from ish on the end, because this participates in the green family, but it's not green. It's a muddy yellow. So coming back here, I'm just going to go back in and send that. And I just like this better and better as I look at it. It's just... I really like where that's going. It feels the colors are just so much nicer. And now this is like a very gray green right here. Uh, I think it's worth noting that a lot of my process of painting. Um, I work into what I'll say are mistakes, but maybe it's worth noting that I I do believe that we make mistakes on our canvases, I do, but I don't even think it's useful to call everything a mistake. Um, sometimes it's better 
to mentally frame something as being an evolution. It gets you a lot less angry at your canvas. So if it sounds like I'm from the generation that gives everyone a trophy, um, says, you know, no, you didn't make a mistake, it's a happy accident, uh, to quote Bob Rust. <laughs> um, no, I'm not saying that at all, but I can't arrive at a complete statement without kind of towing around. I, I have to play around and push something back and forth, left and right, up and down, darker, lighter, redder, bluer, greener, more orange, whatever it might be, in order to find what the thing has to be. Okay, so I put in the half tones right here uh, later in the day. Yesterday, I forgot what time it was. I think it was around like six o'clock. And so it was getting uh, quite a bit darker. And so if you look at the front of the bag, are any of the values in the front of the bag as dark as the values over here? No, they're not. Uh, when you look at my painting, are any of the values right here as dark as right, as right on this side? Uh, yes, and so that was a mistake. Um, again, as I was painting in the fading light and it was an overcast day, um, I just didn't pick up on it. But if this whole thing, let's not think of it as being a crinkled bag, let's think of it instead as being uh, a cube. If light is hitting the front of that cube, no amount of detail right here can really be as dark as anything on the far plane right over there. So if it's the case that that was a mistake, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go right in and this is called scumbling. If you remember from a previous painting session together, scumbling is putting lighter paint thinly over a darker ground. Whereas glazing is putting a darker paint, relatively speaking, over a lighter ground. So I am not glazing right now, but I'm scumbling. But as I make these changes, I'm not eliminating that overshot, where I overshot over here, I'm not eliminating that. I'm just gliding right over it and letting it breathe through. Um, I, like, I like letting my searching marks show through. So now the whole entire front of the bag, um, it's receiving the light so much better. Uh, when I first looked at the, the, when I was looking at the bag last night, um, as we were having dinner, I was pleased with it. And then I woke up this morning and it was like, you ever hear like the scratchy violin from a horror movie? Um, that's kind of what I felt when I looked at it. I was like, ah, everything's wrong. Again, I was painting it in the, in the dark. It's not a bad activity to do, but in the morning my eye was like, you overshot, you overshot. And so right here, again, just lightening that up. And okay, so, so the whole entire front of the bag, I'm now going to share one of the most important concepts that I hold in painting. And to share that, um, I have to talk about phrasing. So phrasing in music, um, phrasing in music is where you have a passage that is very loud. So fortissimo, very loud. You have another passage that's very quiet. Um, so when you have those passages, you have to be respectful of what passage you're in and to not exceed that passage. And so to that extent, um, I think of, like let's go to Dvorak. Dvorak has dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum and he introduces with like a mezzo forte that goes to a forte. So that's kind of loud. And then he has the next passage and he returns to the same theme. He goes dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. Very quiet. So why am I saying that? Because he's very carefully controlling his phrasing so that he never trespasses onto the other um to the other dynamic range to the other, um, I should say, loudness, the quietness, he, he never trespasses one to the other. That is what's going on right here. So on the front plane of this, I should never trespass and get something as dark as on the side plane. 
And on the side plane over here, I can never trespass. Even if I see light in here, and there is light, that light can never trespass onto that right there. And that's called phrasing. I mean, it's not technically called phrasing. I call it phrasing when I teach my students. So now let me double back and explore a little bit more the light on the front of the bag. If you notice, I'm mixing up a ton of paint, a ton of paint on the brush. And I'm just gonna start pulling that paint around the shape of the bag. I have to be really careful um, going back again to that whole idea of phrasing. So there's the phrasing between this object and that object. That is my screaming, singing climax of a piccolo soaring above the rest of the, the orchestra. Um, this can never approach that value. That value always has to be king, it has to be the principal value in the hierarchy of light. That's the brightest bright. This, the brightest bright, can never be as bright as there. So again, this whole idea of phrasing. And I'm not being too specific. You'll notice over here, um, I'm not being too specific at all. And my reason, it's very intentional why I'm not being specific. Because I have time to be specific down the road. But I can't get too specific here until I figure out a lot of what's going on elsewhere. So, it needs a little bit more light over here, right in front of the egg. Now, where is this cast shadow coming from? It's kind of vague. It could be coming from the side of the pot um, somewhat. It could be coming from the side of here. If it's coming from the side of the pot, then this egg probably has to sit a little bit lower. Um, I'll work on that later, I don't really care. But if wherever it's coming from, it's casting a shadow right here, then it just means it's gonna get lighter right there. And a trick that I do is if you look at my palette, um, as you look at my palette, the thing that you'll see is as you look at my palette right here, the thing that you see is this area is never as light as that. I actually flip my eye back and forth and the whitest white right here is my climax. This area always has to be somewhat darker. So I flip my eye right back and forth. Um, a friend of mine, Mark D'Alessio, um, taught me in painting to always put a piece of pure white paint on your easel and a piece of pure black paint or a piece of white tape, a piece of black tape. And that shows you the dynamic range, the outermost extremes, where you think your dark is dark, but then you look at that black and you say, well, that's the blackest black I can go. I'm doing that here right now where I have this on my palette and I've already looked at this on my palette so I know it's a little bit darker and so I know how light and how dark to go. And that's definitely too abrupt a transition. The remembering the, the weight of the bag, the sack filled and it has gravity acting on it. So now I'm just gonna come in and I have my um, rosemary, uh, I'm sorry, this is a Zeki uh, Kalinsky sable. I'm just going in and I'm softening right here. Okay, so now that passage feels like some cast light. Now, I, maybe I went a little bit too dark on the tabletop here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab a little bit more light and I'm gonna go back into that tabletop.
and see if I can get a little bit more light on the tabletop so I can feel the light raking across. The color of the table is obviously not the color of the egg, but they're in the same family. Um, I could have selected white eggs up, right? So that the white eggs would have really popped off. But then the painting would have been um, kind of redundant. It would have been um, the cream of the milk being white, the reflections being white, the bag being white, and then the background being kind of a, you know, a washed out grayish um, color. And that was a little too compressed for me. I didn't want it to be that compressed in terms of coloration. So that feels much, much better where the shadow coming up the side of this needs to be clear, and I couldn't have all shadow all through here. I might even go a little bit brighter yet. If you notice, I'm really not looking at nature. I'm kind of making up what I need to see. Um, back a few years ago, a number of years ago, I was at the Salma Gundy Club in New York City a wonderful, wonderful destination for artists and art lovers. And I saw Richard Schmidt painting. And Richard Schmidt did a demo. And somebody raised their hands, and they're very respectful, but they said, Richard, we noticed that what you're painting doesn't look at all like what you're seeing, what you're looking at, and yet what you're painting is really beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And Richard turns to the camera, and when the woman said, I'll repeat it, when the woman said, we notice that what you're painting is different than what you're looking at, but what you're painting looks really beautiful. And Richard turns to the audience and he goes, what I'm looking at is a suggestion, but I could have a higher idea of it. He's like, no matter what, I'm a servant to that thing, but I'm not a slave to it. Um, maybe I added that servant slave part on, but he said, what I'm looking at is, is a suggestion uh, but I have a higher thing that I'm looking at. So he he kind of gave me, it was very inspiring because in fact his still life painting was much better than the objects that we were looking at. So as I design this, I'm not a slave to that tabletop. But that tabletop has to serve the larger statement of what it is I'm trying to do. And I want that egg to just pop even a little bit more yet. So again, I'm dragging the brush over the canvas. If you notice how I angle the brush, and then it leaves the canvas on the peaks, uh, leaves the pigment, the paint on the peaks of the canvas. It doesn't quite fill the valleys of the canvas. Um, so I like that effect. It got a little bit over sharp there. So I've done so much back and forth that what I might do now is get another dry brush out. This is a rosemary uh, size 8 and it's a Martora Kalinsky sable. And I'm just going to come back in and then feather that out. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. And now I can see the light on the table still could come up just a little bit more. Because I want that raking light effect. But I don't want the tabletop to get brighter than the egg. So it's a dance. Okay, so I've maintained that sense of cast shadow um, coming off. And I'm just gonna jump over to one other area on the canvas. Uh, right here, there, I'm playing around with different ideas. How do I get it really light right here, and yet how do I make the side of this present, like where it has presence to it? 
um, do I keep that dark there or do I make this dark? Um, I like sorting out all of these problems with you uh, so that you can see. I don't have a solution right now, but I'm going to step back and I'm going to take a look at it. And as I look at nature, I think I have the, the setup a little bit too close. I'm going to move this over. My wife has me put away the milk every day so the house doesn't smell rancid. Um, she's right, I'm wrong. Um, so I think I need to go a little bit darker on the backdrop. I'm going to play around with that. Darker in the background, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to go a little bit darker right here and see how that goes. It doesn't really make sense, that dark. But kind of like what I was talking about with Velasquez earlier, um, painting doesn't always have to make sense. Wh why does it get so dark right here? I don't really need to tell my viewer why. At the end of the painting, I can jump back in and just try to like finesse some of these uh, half lies that I've been telling. But for right now, um, it's enough for me to just put the moments in and to let them kind of like sort themselves out, hopefully, in time. Sometimes I never do. Um, and so I leave areas unresolved. Um, but I am going to put a little bit more light there and make an attempt to kind of synthesize those two areas. I wanted to go a little bit lighter here to give us another moment of visual interest. And now I'm just really letting the two sides kind of duke it out. Um, I will return to that definitely a little bit later. But now I want to find the light right on the side of here. It's very, very blue. Um, it actually looks like white just touched with a tiny bit of ivory black, and touched with a tiny bit of king's blue. I'm gonna loosen it up a little because it's not so thick. And I'm just gonna drag right up here. Just like that. All right, so um, definitely went too light. Um, I don't really care, I can just go right back into it. But I like it. I really like um, how that pronounces the side of the bottle. I don't need to really sort out everything that's going on right here. But with that, I now feel the side of the bottle. Um, that little piece of dark in the background is feeling wrong. But again, it, these things don't trouble me. I can just work right into it because the idea is right. It does need a little moment of dark right there. And I've kind of resolved through a gentle gradient that whole area, whereas before it was like sticking out. I don't want something that far back to stick out. I think we're coming up just about to the end of our time. There's a highlight just one highlight away, just to the side of that. And this highlight is, is pretty, it's kind of like a cream color. It starts right here. Let me step back just to double check this. And it comes just like this. And again, I place my brush sideways and I pull up. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to write them in. I think we're right at the end of our time and then another cream color thinner here. Like two side by side. And that must be the window. Actually, it must, must be the window sash. Um, so with that, we're pretty much at the end of our time today. And oh, I think I have a question here. And, okay, is that one of the sharp pencils? Oh, 
Uh, Sarah, thank you for writing that. Um, I meant to bring it around to that point. Uh, so thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, so yes, that is one of the sharp passages, absolutely. Um, if I were, if I had better self-control, I probably would have waited on that for a little while. I, I'm not entirely sure. But um, take a look at John Singer Sargent's painting. We, I spoke about this uh, about 20 lessons ago. But John Singer Sargent's painting of Madame X, and in that painting, look at the table that Madame X has her hand on, and look at the highlight on the table. So it's said that um, Sargent took 20 to 23 tries to get that highlight, and he would put the highlight on, and it was like, didn't work, wipe it off completely. He put it on, didn't work, wipe it off completely. It took 20 something tries, he slashed the highlight across the page, across the canvas, it was perfect. Um, why didn't he just get a small brush out and paint it, paint it, paint it? Well, it's a very sharp passage. It's a very bright passage in that painting. And he wanted to fill his work with moments of crisp, sharp spontaneity. Um, it's so important. So Sargent's work almost gives across this like liquid, um, improvisational kind of like expressive energy, but that expression, expressive energy was sometimes very studied and very deliberate. So why am I saying that right now? That is an area that's gonna stand out to the viewer and it has to be crisp, it has to be sharp, it has to be bright, but it also has to have some expressive force to it. Um, so maybe I, I could have held off on it a little bit longer. I, I didn't really want to, I felt like putting it in. Um, but that crisp right over there is not competing with the soft transitions all over here. So they're really, in all the painting I did today over here, there's nothing sharp. So everything over here goes into shadows and the crisp sharp passages right here advance. The side of the egg, I went crisper sharper. Um, I'll even go in with smaller brushes, maybe once it dries, and I'll make that even sharper yet right there. So that egg is gonna advance the highlight is going to have the front of the jar advance, and this is all going to retreat. So generally speaking, but again, there are formulas, but then we have definite exceptions. Generally speaking, shadows recede. Shadows go away. Uh, shadows are soft transitions. Don't use that in a formulaic way because then your work will look contrived. But think about it as a general principle. Everything is receding right here. It's soft. It's going away. Everything right here is advancing and that's advancing. So that's, Sarah, that's exactly that uh, soft and sharp play um, that I was talking about. So thank you for asking that question, it's perfect.